number one for the Zorch podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. I am Chris Zorch, and on today's show, we have a true Notre Dame leader, fellow alum, a trustee, benefactor to the university, vice chairman of Piper Sandler, and huge golf enthusiast, which we have to talk about that as well. And the way we actually, I kind of saw him just kind of happened to actually find him. He actually did the commencement speech for Notre Dame's uh, graduation happened in May. It was phenomenal. After the speech, after the commencement speech, I wanted to have you on. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Dunn. Thank you so much, sir. Chris, great to be here. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to chatting. I Absolutely. I've watched you a long time. <laughs> well, I was, that was a long time ago. Hopefully when, you know, when we were, I was on the field. Um, That's correct. Interesting enough, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. Uh, obviously, the whole golf enthusiast thing. Also, I happen to, I'm, I'm a huge cigar smoker. Happened to run across an article that was in Cigar Aficionado, so I want to talk about that as well. But before all that, I kind of want to go way, way back and literally talk about kind of you growing up in New York. Sure. Sure, yeah. Uh, I grew up in Long Island, New York on the South Shore. It's uh, you know down by the water. We've always had a, an affinity and attraction for the water, and uh, I went to a, you know just a local grade school there, St. Joseph's Grammar School, which unfortunately is not there anymore. But okay. St. Joseph's Grammar School, and then to West High Slip to St. John the Baptist High School, which is very much there. Three of my four sisters went there. My oldest went to a Catholic school further out, Seton Hall, before St. John's was around. Okay. And you know had a great experience. Uh, enjoyed it was a great place to grow up we had like we said we played a lot of golf played a lot of sports had the sea had a, a great great foundation of an education good friends and it was a it was a great place to grow up it really was so Still is. the the idea of kind of grew up on growing up by the water uh tell us a little bit about your parents were they kind of blue collar workers um was it a situation you talked about getting involved in sports um was it something that everybody in the neighborhood did or i mean yeah. how did that happen uh, my parents neither graduated from college. Uh, my father, I think, went for a, went to Siena for a year or two, and then uh, got a promotion in his job. So he he was after he he served in World War II. That's where they met, actually. Wow. And they were both from Albany and Troy, New York. <clears throat> and so he went to school up there for a while, and then worked for Arrow Shirts, and he headed down to Long Island to go into Manhattan, and that that was the end of the the college trip. But uh, uh, they were both, uh, you know, my father, both, both were very bright. My, my mother, I was always fascinated how well she could spell. I'm still the world's worst speller, but she was, <laughs> she, was uh, she was terrific. And she was a voracious reader. And uh, it was very, I'd see her every night reading a book somewhere. But uh, wow. my dad worked very hard. He left real early and then came home late. And I'd visit with him when he got home. But, and we talked for a while. But he, I, I, get, I would, you know, I would say that, they, you know, they were, I don't know if I'd call it blue collar, but it was, you know, they were middle class and yeah. uh, and both smart, both very hard workers, and and uh, you know they 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 had a vision of how they wanted things to go. They wanted their kids to go to college. They wanted the kids to go to Catholic school. It was very important to them. So before we start talking about kind of the the interest in Notre Dame, where did this this golf fascination come from? Did it come from high school or where did that come from? Well, I was a caddy. And okay. That, really, that was a, a, a very smart thing. Well, my, my father loved golf. He was not a particularly good golfer. He felt it also was a, a great sport. You could play it your whole life. And he thought that would be very helpful in meeting people in business. And he felt he had, he had been, since he was really not a golfer, he didn't get into certain places and things that, sure. that might have been beneficial. So he for whatever reason, he told me there were three really important things and, and being good enough at golf so he weren't scared to death on the first tee was one of them. <laughs> and so we'd wake up, he'd wake me up at 4 a.m. and we'd go to a public course, sign up, wait forever, have breakfast, hit balls, talk, wow. and then play nine holes and come back. And then eventually he got into a private club and mm. and uh, and then I, I and then I, I was 11 years old and he said, you should caddy. And I said, well, you got to be 14. He said, well, just tell him you're 14. And, uh, <laughs> and so I started caddying when I was 11. And you found out in that caddy yard, there were two ways to have status. One was that you were a pretty good player. And the other was that you were a reasonable card player. And I always had a good memory. And, and uh, so I 
the cards came kind of easy to me and in golf i was able to work at it and once you know you, once you got that enthusiasm and you got people recognize it and then the older caddies would ask you to play on monday and then you were playing for a little bit of money <laughs> it, all, it all came together pretty nicely. So that's I, great I, I, credit, I credit that caddy yard with a lot of my a lot of the things i learned and i i had both of my sons caddy uh, out here in long island as wow. well i think they enjoyed it too well so i was gonna ask enjoyed it, but they got a lot out of it well i was gonna ask you about what about your siblings did they did, did they participate as well or were you the the lone ranger there well, I, it was one boy and two older sisters, two younger sisters. Mm -hmm. My older sisters were all, you know, very athletic. And uh, my younger sister is extremely athletic. She's a very good golfer. In fact, she's the club champion at, at Seminole right now. And wow. uh, so uh, they were all pretty athletic. And uh, But golf was sort of a thing my dad and I kind of did. And oh, that's that was, cool. And then when I started every day getting up, my mother would drive me every day, drop me off at at, at the and then I would either hitchhike home or get a ride from a member or wow. whatever I would do to get home. That was a different day. You could do that then. Oh and, my uh, gosh! So I spent all days there, and it was it was a great education. I learned a lot about golf. I learned a lot about people. I made money, made friends. It was uh, it was I really appreciate it. Hmm. Well, I, I can't imagine the relationship that you and your dad shared, kind of in in that environment. I mean, kind of knowing that that I mean. He was kind of doing this for your future, but also allowed him to kind of have a chance to participate as well. But again, have that father and son conversation. It was it was it was a great experience. Uh, he was an incredibly smart guy, uh, and he was he was he he believed in character and and he would early on he would talk about leaders and people that stood up for something and. And these would be all conversations we'd be having. And I was eight, nine, ten years old. Wow. And he would talk all about people he respected and didn't respect and why. So I, he built, he, he knew what he was doing. We didn't, you know, I, as I said, we didn't always get along that well because he was usually right. And I was young and stubborn <laughs> and you know how that goes. But, uh, but I, you know, we, there was a lot of affection and a lot of uh, respect and a lot of tension <laughs> wow. because we're both pretty headstrong. But, uh, you know, he was always there for me. And my mother died when I, we were, I was a uh, September of my senior year of high school. So I was uh, 16 when she uh, died and, and she, you know, she was, she was different. She was, she was very smart, but she was very tough. And it was, it, it, I just learned a lot about life. It was a great place to grow up. Wow. Wow. So when you come, when you combine kind of your, your caddying, experience, your caddying experiences kind of with having this great male figure in your home and then also kind of your mom being this voracious reader. Um, I mean, was the level of expectation just so high? I mean, were you, do you know you're, you're going to go to college? Well, I, you know, I told that, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we were all going to college. There was That's no, awesome. There was no doubt about that. That That's was awesome. that was a definite. Uh, she, you know, that was an absolute given that we were they they didn't go and we were going, so that was understood. And uh, you know, my father said spent a lot of time talking about leadership and and what you wanted to do. Uh, you know, I can remember uh, you know uh, when you think about Notre Dame, Notre Dame was always that place kind of afar. And, uh, you know, our, my really introductions to it was the first I told that story at the commencement, but my mother described it as the finest school in the country. So, I mean, that made an impression at six. And then as I got a little bit older, I think a lot of us of our generation watched Lindsay Nelson on, on at WPIX. Wow. Uh, with the Sunday morning highlights in Notre Dame football. We watched them religiously, you know, and uh, and so that was always that was always sort of a, a special place, a castle in the distance. And then as I got through high school, um, I, I, you know, I started to think about what different colleges and, you know, we didn't visit any colleges in those right, days. Right. I wasn't, you know, at your level, I wasn't recruited to go anywhere to do anything. And, uh, and I can remember though, that, that September, my, my mother was not well, she was in the hospital. She was, she was suffering with cancer. And I remember going over one day, she, this day she was in a chair, not in the bed. And I was like, oh, God, maybe she's getting better, you know. And uh, and she sat down and she said, look, Jimmy, you, you, I want you to really think about this. This is important stuff. And, you know, you listen to your father very, very carefully. And he's an incredibly smart man. So that's a good decision. 
but you know he has a lot of influence on you and and you got to decide if you want to go to Notre Dame it's because you want to go to Notre Dame and if you want to go to Jacksonville to play golf or Wake Forest to try to play golf or Rollins College you've got to own that decision and I remember him you know she was literally sitting in the bed sitting sitting in the chair and she was all about that and you got to own this and you got you know you got to decide if your dad's smart but you it's, anyway and when I left, I, you know, I said to the doctor, well, she was in the chair, so that's a good sign. He said, well, Jimmy, she spent all day trying to get in that chair to talk to you today. So I, it was really impactful. Wow. And then uh, she died that night. Mm. And, uh, so, but it was my decision to go to Notre Dame. It was, now my father was totally for it, and I think my mother would have been thrilled about it. But, uh, and, and when we got there, I had never seen it. He took me there and he kind of, you know, that was that that the following uh, the following August, and we pulled up in those days. You can pull right. Well, I still can right by Alumni Hall, by where the bus stop was. But you and I were there, right? And, or you know, I was there before you. But uh, and he, you know, said, "Okay, I got you this far, son. The rest is up to you." <laughs> and, you know, he took my hand, got back to the car, and he, you know, he had work. Wow. He had stuff he had to get back to do. But it was it was a it was a very important decision and in our family my older my older sister went to boston college then my eileen went to villanova i went to notre dame and my two younger sisters both went to boston college so hmm. we were all going to college and most likely we're all going to catholic college that's that, that is just, that is absolutely amazing story and, and the, the idea that that obviously they didn't have a chance to go but understanding understanding what it takes for their kids and more importantly, knowing kind of even though they did, they didn't attend, knowing what it took to succeed. And I think that's a message that you know if, if you're going to college or if you're not in your job wherever, I mean that's something you can always always take with you. Yeah, he my father was always big on leadership. Make your own mistakes. Don't don't follow somebody off the Brooklyn Bridge. You know he <laughs> would go through all of that litany of stuff. And when something went awry at school, you would have to, you know, he would start the interrogation. And at some point you did something that sure. warranted some action. Sure. And then your case was lost. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was, you know, he was a tough grader and uh, he, he believed in responsibility. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was a, a great, a great, a great man. He really was. And I, I, you know, he taught me to anticipate, to think about what's coming and to go back when you, you talked about getting grades, I, I can remember I, I always I had trouble reading and, okay. and I still kind of read it a very odd way. But uh, um, and I remember I, I brought home a note from the teacher. That, you know, this is like third grade or fourth grade. And it said basically that, you know, he only got a 68, but because he can't read at this level, it's actually pretty good. And this and that. I remember my mother reading and she like you know, and she was much more aggressive than my father. She just ripple, crumbled it up, threw it out and said, what does this nun teach? I said, well, she teaches English, I think. She says, okay, you have to get 100% in that class, Jim. Not an A, not, a, not, a, you have to get, I mean, she would put the pressure on you. And I worked, believe it, I worked harder probably in grade school than I did in college. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I got A's. And uh, oh but it wasn't gosh. because I was doing it the right way. I wish she had taken me to the reading tutor or somebody. That would have been very, <laughs> we, I just memorized stuff, and it was actually wow. a bit, you know it actually became something that was useful to me later on. But but her attitude was, you know, I don't care about any of that. You can do this, and and that that was just her belief. And for me, it worked out very well. For other people, it might have put up too much strain, or sure. it might have been, you know, today it would not be viewed as the right way to do it. And I'm not debating any of that. But for me. You know, it, it, I, I, you know, I, I was, I understood what she was saying and I was able to do it. Now, I, did I have to work harder than everybody else? Yeah, because I literally have to memorize the thing. But, uh, but it was, it was, it was, a, it, you know, it gave me confidence. I knew I could do it if I put my mind to it, regardless of what the problems were. I was working the whole time and, and caddying and making extra money. And then we, we started a little company called Tuition Paying Painters while we were in high school. So we would, Caddy in the morning, paint in the afternoon, or vice versa, or whatever we had to do, and, wow. and it was it was a great it was a great experience. My 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 best pal Chris Quackenbush and I both caddied together, played golf against each other, with each other, painted houses together, and it was you know it was it, it was pretty idyllic, really. It was really good.
But golf was a very important part of it because getting better, being around adults, watching people, how they behaved, who was who had class, who was a jerk. You, 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 like if you play golf today, I almost can tell you whether the guy caddied or not. Really? Yeah. Just by his mannerisms, how he handles himself, wow. how he treats the caddy. You know, you can tell guy, and I call caddies, it's sort of an instinctual behavior. You you get golf at a very young age and it stays with you. You, <sighs> you can get it at a later age and it's great, but it's not quite the same. Wow. You know, it, it just, it's more of an acquired characteristic. Wow. And isn't there like a national caddying program or something like that at Notre Dame or like to give scholarships or something like that? Or? Yeah, they, we, 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 we're tied with the uh, Chick Evans scholarship. We, we don't allow them to have their own dorm, just like we don't have athletes to have their own dorm. Okay. Do that. We believe in. So that's one. Generally, at other schools, they have their own dorm. All the Evans scholars are together. Wow. We, we, we won't do that, which we shouldn't. But we do take individual scholars and I've met a bunch of them and, and contributed to it. And it's. It's a nice thing. It's a it's a great great program. Caddying, I, I would advise everybody to get their kids caddying, and uh, there's just no downside to it. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Um, so one of the things that you actually mentioned, and I'm trying to kind of go chronologically through here, um, there was a story that you talked about at the commencement um, that actually kind of brought me to tears because I thought about a situation happened with my mom. But would you mind sharing? It was just a simple story of your mom talking about how important she felt the Catholic education was, and she yeah. made a comment. Can you yeah. share that story with us, please? Uh, yeah, it's a very it's a true story. She was she was um, uh, uh, sweeping the kitchen floor, and all my friends basically we all played baseball. We were real young at this time, and you know we you know those days you you let them out, and she came in when the, the street lights went on and came home. And, it, it, you know, we played baseball, kickball, whatever it is. And uh, most all of my friends at that time in that very narrow couple blocks all went to public school. And I went to this place and I, I didn't understand why why we were doing that. And then I saw an envelope, which meant you had to give five dollars a month. I'd have to bring that and give it to the teacher. OK. And, uh, you know, and I and so I came up with the great idea that, look, I can save you the five bucks a month. Send me to the, where my friends go. And I remember like it was yesterday, she put the broom down again. She was big and I, I guess sitting and talking and she sat, she said, she told me sit over here. She sat down and mm. she basically just said, look, you know, this is the way it is. Uh, and, and she basically said that your father has worked very hard. He's a smart man and he's saved. And so we can afford to send you to Catholic school. But if we can't, I'll go to Grand Central Station and clean out the bathrooms to make sure you can go there. That's how important this is. So I didn't, you know, I didn't really understand it, but I understood that she thought it was important. Right. And I and I remember just saying at that point in time, does this mean like I'm going to have to go to college too and all this other stuff? I, I didn't know what to do, you know. And uh, she said, well, absolutely, and and you're going to go to the best, and, and hopefully you'll go to the best college in in the country. And I just fortunately said, well, what, which one is that? How do you know? And she goes, well, that's the University of Notre Dame. You'll learn about that as time goes on. And that was wow. literally the first time I had ever heard. It. And so, really? so, but she really believed strongly in a Catholic education. And that's one of the points that I wanted to make at the commencement. And I was assumed that, you know, we could get some blowback on Twitter and this and that, because we're not allowed to say that anymore. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, which is insane. Quite actually, quite the opposite. People reacted almost unanimously positive to it, even if they're uh, Catholic or not Catholic, just the idea that we have a right to this and, and treasure it and appreciate it. And, and it's, been, it's been very beneficial to my family and, 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 and to many families, as you know. Absolutely. And, and the, the story that made me think of it about my mom was a story about um, we had gone to, uh, we had the opportunity to go to a bowl game. And at that time, we started, we, we had a team meeting. Uh, we were playing University of Miami. We had a team meeting on the evening of Christmas, and then we started practice literally the next day. Right. And I remember the the coaches getting a flight for me like at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning. And my mom was like, you know, hey, there's no way this is not going to happen. Well, I mean, I, I'd gone home, I think, maybe a, a week before that. So I was calling the coaches. Hey, you know what? My mom, 
you know, she wants me to stay a little longer. And they were like, no, sorry. And right. finally, my mom went to the bank. And she took, so we had like, I think it was like $230 or something like that in a bank account. That was all she had. And she took it out because she said, you know, I want to hang out with you a little bit longer on Christmas Day than taking you, me and your uncle taking you to the airport. And I was like, well, I was like, sure, mom, whatever. I mean, I'm a kid. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. She's like, well, call him again. Call him again. So I just can't do anything. When she came back and she put the money on our kitchen table. I was like, whoa, she's serious. So I called him up. I was like, guys, look, you know, my mom just took out, we, this is all we have. My mom took out this money. There's no way I'm leaving at 10. And they're like, "What? okay, fine. And he, eventually they called later and said, okay, you know, we found your later flight. And that, that really sounds, it, it really doesn't sound like a lot, right? But you, you, uh, you fast forward uh, a couple of days and unfortunately, um, on Christmas of that year, that was the last time I would see my mom alive because unfortunately she passed away January 2nd of 91. And this was December 25th of 1990. And so, Jimmy, I'll tell you, when you were telling that story, I mean, I was watching it in my office, YouTube, I just, tears just started to come because I thought about how great and how awesome moms are, right? And they are so selfless and she didn't care she wouldn't have cared if she had to wash the bathroom in Grand Central Station Union, wherever it was, because she was going to do something for her kid that was going to be important. And you were at an age that you didn't know what the hell that was, but it was important for her. And I kind of saw that, that same thing with my mom, even though it was just going to be a couple hours, she was willing to take out her life savings to buy a ticket just so she could spend three or four more hours for me. Now she didn't know, you know, she was going to pass away, but it was just that idea of kind of our, our, our moms being so selfless for their kids. Yeah. My, my, well, they're different, you know, and uh, you know, there's something to be said, you know, I always have this uh, debate actually with my buddy, uh, Jerry McElroy about, is it easier to raise children with money or without it? And I, I think that there are, there are arguments for both sides because, sure. You knew, I mean, that was all she had and she was willing to spend it. That's a statement. So it got your attention. You were not going to go to the foot. You know, you're going to have to work that out. And gratefully, the, hopefully somebody in the foot football office sort of figured it out eventually too. But, you know, those are, those are the things that you remember. And, uh, and that, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of fundamentally, there's been everybody's sacrificed some to get their families to Notre Dame. I mean, that, that's, that's just the nature of the beast and it continues to be. And it's just it's part of the part of the price that that we pay. And then we recognize for what what people did. It was more meaningful. That was that was meaningful to you. Obviously, how she did it. It was meaningful to me that she put the broom down, sat me down. This is the deal. And it's Notre Dame. And uh, so, you know, and now that isn't to say that she and I didn't fight over everything. And That's you know, right. <laughs> she exactly. was, was seldom right, but never in doubt on most issues. <laughs> okay, but and just typical of that, she she had absolute views. Notre Dame was the finest school in the country. And now, what's ironic about that is I having gone there, having had two sons there, having seen it right from the inside, I now agree with her. It is the finest <laughs> school, and she had, you know, she had never been there, never, uh, never, never set foot on the place. But that was mm. her view, and that's you know, those are the great things about you. You know, you only get one mother, you get one father, and and uh, you know, that's 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 part of the whole Notre Dame that's all tied in. It's, it's, it's a combination of what we got from our parents, what we got at the school, what we got from each other. It's, it's, it, you know, I guess it does sort of take a, a village or it takes a whole group of people would be the, to, to get, to get the job done. Sir. And, and speaking about your father gets, he shakes your hand and says, all right, son, you're off. I have to go back to work. So now you're, you're freshman at Notre Dame. I mean, how was it for you? Were you kind of fish out of water? I mean, was this just a great place for you? Well, you know, it's a it's a good question, Chris. Uh, I was, you know, this is sort of, I mean, this is people don't really believe this, but I was incredibly shy in high school. Really? And I even, you know, words didn't come together that easily for me. I was couldn't speak publicly. I had I couldn't read in sequence. You know, where you know you'd have to read. I used to dread that. My palms would sweat. And, and in high school, 
I didn't really have a particular place to go. You know, I was not a full athlete because golf in high school in the 70s was not a sport, you know. And uh, I wasn't on the football team or the baseball team. And I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't with the complete drug culture. I wasn't with the, uh, I didn't fit into one, any particular group, which has proven to be a great thing in my life, frankly. But at that time, you would literally go to lunch and I didn't really have a place that was comfortable to sit. Wow. And so what I did is I, I would basically not go to lunch and I would go to the library and I worked on my reading skills and my retention and all those types of things. And in fact, I went to lunch one time at the end of the year and I got a detention because they just assumed I was skipping class. And <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to tell them that, you know, it was like a badge of honor. I said, okay, yeah. So I served the detention even though it was, I, 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 I didn't qualify. So, you know, so I can vividly remember thinking now when I go to Notre Dame, you know, it's a clean, you know, Springsteen talks about a white sheet of paper. There's nothing better in life than sitting on the back of that car driving out of Jersey with a white sheet of paper. And he talks about that in his show. And I, I, I really agree with him. And uh, so when I went to Notre Dame, I thought, okay, now this is, you know, you, you can become, you don't have to be the guy that's too shy to sit there or, hmm. or doesn't talk to any girls or doesn't, you know, whatever doesn't, you know, I don't, you know, you, you know, you go out and make friends and, 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 you know, they, they don't know you, you know, go out and reinvent yourself. And, right. uh, and so I, I looked at going to Notre Dame as a great opportunity. And then we were just very blessed, uh, in a couple of weeks time, all the guys that I, that were on that first floor at alumni hall, they're all coming out here for four or five days in August in that Johnny Coyne and Souls Coyne, Rich Riley, Stan Zero. You know, wow. unfortunately, Jimmy's passed away, but Jimmy Martin, we were all on that floor together. And we've just had lifelong friendships, you know, wow. that, that developed that. So I, I really, and I, when I got there, I, I sort of felt like I had gotten in on the skin of my teeth. So I really worked pretty hard the freshman first semester and I did okay. well. And after that, it was not quite the same intensity, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I really, I, I love being at Notre Dame. And the other thing I can remember when I was thinking about going and I was thinking about what my mother had said there in September, and that was, it was getting to those points where you had to decide. Now, first thing I had to decide is I had to get in, which was not easy. All right. And then if I got in, what, what, what would I decide to do? And I, I remember catting for a guy and he asked me, you know, what, what are your plans, Jimmy? What are you thinking about? I said, well, I'm not sure I might get into Notre Dame, but you know, I kind of want to play golf. So I'm thinking about going to Rollins and this and that. And he said, you know, Jimmy, let me, let me tell you something, you know, and this goes to, I, you know, I watched that our great new defensive coordinator talking about recruiting and Notre Dame guys and who is and who isn't and this type okay. of, thing. you know, he said, if you, if you go to Rollins, you could have a good experience. You could play golf. Who knows where that'll take you? But the rest of your life, you're going to have to explain where Rollins is. And you're going to have to say how, and again, I don't, Rollins is a great school. My, right. my daughter wanted my daughter to go there. And it's a great place in Winter Park, Florida. But this is just what he said. And sure. this was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. He said, but you're going to have to explain where it is for the rest of your life. And this guy, Chris Quackenbush, that I caddied with, you know, he said, look, you're going to be uh, a middle range 75 shooter your whole life. You're not going to go play. You're not playing on the tour. That's crazy, you know. But he said, if you go to Notre Dame, some people will love it. Some people will hate it. But you never have to explain to anybody where it is. Mm. And that really made an impression on me. And then, and maybe half of it was I wasn't sure if I was going to get in. Sure. But once I got in, I was going. And uh, and the first time I ever saw anything was the day my father dropped me. We literally, and I still, you know, when I come in now, I try to get the pilots to go that same route. Uh -huh. And uh, we flew right over the dome. And I remember him saying, hey, son, take a look at this. And we were like, it was like you could touch it. Wow. And I remember thinking, man, this is, this is, the, this is the big time now. And, I, and I've, you know, I've, I've gotten just a lot out of it. It's, I've, I've, loved, I've loved all my levels of association, both as a parent, a student, uh, an alumni, a trustee, you name it. I've, I've enjoyed it. So... This individual that that you were caddying for was he an alum? I'm assuming he, he wasn't. Went, alum. He went to Union College. Did not was not Catholic. See, and so here that I mean, if that's not like the perfect kind of story of 
what Notre Dame means to people, not even if you even go there, but just what it means in general, right? Absolutely. I mean, here's a kid or here's a guy who sees the kids kind of like, well, I'm not sure. Even, hey, I want to play golf. And even if it was, let's say, I mean, wherever it was, eventually you're going to stop playing golf. Now, you know, as an 18-year-old, you want to play forever, sports, whatever it is. But here's a guy from Union College is thinking about, you know, hey, you know, really understanding what this kid has. He has an opportunity to go to Notre Dame and literally could literally change his life. Well, and, and, and I, I've kind of taken that lesson. Both Chris Quackenbush said, you know, you're, you're going to shoot in the mid-70s your whole life, which, by the way, he's about correct, okay? Uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, so you better buy a winter coat and go to South Bend. <laughs> and, uh, and Bob Ty, who is not Catholic, went to Union College. Chris went to University of North Carolina and then NYU Law School. And uh, But they both had a lot of respect for Notre Dame, and, and I remember them talking about it. And it just – I, I, you know, it was, the, it was, it, I like, I like to answer questions. You know, I like, you know, our, our firm was a two wall street, you know, I, I love now we're not, we're at 1251 Abbey, the Americans, but when we first sure. started Stanley, we were at two wall street. Right. I, we went, I went to Notre Dame. I, I like that. You know, I like those, I like those answers to questions. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was a great decision for me. I made lifelong friends and, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. You're listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Jimmy Dunn. Uh, for those folks who are in the Chicagoland area, I will be emceeing Notre Dame's Rockney Gala, excuse me, Notre Dame of Chicago's Rockney Gala on Thursday, July 22nd, where I'll be hosting a Q&A session with, uh, Jimmy mentioned him, our defensive coordinator, Marcus Freeman. Um, He's going to, we'll have a chance to have a lot of stuff for recruiting. There's some things he can and can't talk about, but we're definitely going to have a blast. The, the gala will be held at Morgan MFG at 401 North Morgan from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Please go to IndyChicago.org for more details. So the idea of you kind of learning about this lifelong I would call it membership. There's this lifelong love affair with Notre Dame. I mean, it kind of it doesn't happen overnight. So you were, I'm assuming you stayed all four years in alumni? Well, three years. We moved okay. off to Notre Dame Avenue, the Notre Dame apartment our senior year. Okay. All right. Three all right. Years. So and I and I believe kids should stay three years on campus. I, I oh, absolutely. Not, you know, you're never gonna get this opportunity again, you know. And and uh, so I live, but I was a total alumni hall guy and all, all our pals, and we moved all to the Notre Dame Apartments, all in the alumni hall guys. Oh, that's great. Okay, so kind of as you think about your four years at Notre Dame, were there moments um, that kind of, you didn't know at the time, but kind of maybe, maybe endured you to Notre Dame, kind of those experiences? Um, I know one for me was when my mom first came on the campus for the first time. Um, she didn't go on the recruiting trip. It was after, it was dirt for one of the games. Like she had never been before. So I, I remember that moment. Was, was there any moments for you where you, I mean, you, you literally have lifelong memories? Well, we had, uh, I think like with a lot of people, you know, the football weekends are, are pretty special. And of course I had a different perspective on them than you did, uh, Chris, but uh, you had a little more of an active role. I had more of a drinking role in, in the football <laughs> but, uh, but we both uh, had fun. We both had but, fun. But, it was always a source of pride to have friends come and see it. No one is disappointed with the Notre Dame weekend. Mm. And, and I had, you know, the fellows I caddied for, they, you know, they would want to come to a game. So they would come out to one game a year. We had wow. the guy that I worked for my, my senior year in a bar. He was, he wanted to come out and see, you know, and he was actually hopefully getting me the job at the senior bar. Uh, so, and of course, when my father came out, you know, I, I could see the sense of pride. My mother had passed, right. but I could see the sense of pride my father had. You know, he, he, you know, he, as I, you know, I, when, when, when people ask me, uh, you know, where'd your sons go to school? You know, now it's, you know, now I'm more talking about Seamus's in Columbia Business School. <laughs> CJ has started his own firm uh, called Sage Spot, and Jackie is matriculating over in Paris. So I have great great sources of pride sure. too. Sure. But I but I, I enjoyed 
you know, saying that they were at Notre Dame. And just like I think my father enjoyed him saying at Boston College or Notre Dame. You know, I remember him saying that on his grave site, he wanted to see Boston College, Villanova, Notre Dame, Boston College, Boston College. So that was, <laughs> that was what he thought. I was just, you know, it's one of those many days we went out to play golf early or whatever. Wow. But, you know, it was it was unique. Notre Dame is different. I think what, what the defensive coordinator was talking about on your show, it is a 40-year decision. I think guys are starting to wake up and recognize that not everybody's going to play in the NFL. We send as many as anybody does, by the way. Sure. But, but, uh, but you know, it, it, and if you are, you're not going to play forever. I mean, unless you went to Michigan and would draft 199. <laughs> right, you know, exactly. Number 12. I mean, right. him, he's the only – he may play forever, but <laughs> most everybody else is not going to play forever. And uh, and so uh, it's, it's a unique coupling of everything together. I think the idea that you – meet people from all over the country. I mean, that's an enormously valuable thing. When you, you walk down your quad and you see Hawaii and Zanesville, Ohio, and uh, Sausalito, California, you go, you know, you have all, and, and then the opportunity to visit different places. It's, it's quite unique. And that's why it being a national school has really had a lot of benefits for me and my family. When your children were of age, were they brainwashed or was it one of those situations where, hey, you can go anywhere you want, but by the way, we're going to our name this weekend, uh, the game or? Yeah, you know, I think about that every now and then. <laughs> um, it's sort of interesting. My oldest boy, Seamus, he, he and I would never really get on side on a team. Like he did not like the Yankees. Now he okay. does. But growing up, he was not a Yankee fan. I'm a monstrous Yankee fan. Uh, it just seemed like whatever the issue was, if I zigged, he zagged, with the exception of Notre Dame. Really? He, was, he was an early adopter. He was all, all into it. He, he, he was very, very, uh, you know, that was, and, and I think I took him out to games early. We did some of that. Uh, it would have been hard if he, if like, I didn't really love going to Yankee <laughs> games for him because he's rooting against him and I'm, and it just, you know, but we did it, but my number two guy, he was more, he was a Yankee fan and he, he sort of followed in Seamus's footsteps. So they were, they were both, I, I, I'm sure I did do whatever it was to force feed them. Okay. Right. But, that, but that doesn't mean it's going to take. Right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. You, and, you, you, and, it could be the exact opposite. In, in many cases it is, but in this case, it really wasn't. That's, that's where they wanted to go. And so it was not an issue. It was an issue of, and I, I, I had adopted an attitude of, look, I'm going to pick your high school. Sure. You can pick your college. Mm. And we okay. grew up in the city and I did not want them to go to a city school. I just, I just, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm from Long Island. I just didn't, I, I didn't like it. And mm -hmm. so, and then when I started to look at the schools, I wasn't so thrilled about the New England schools. You know, I've always competed against Southerners. I've always respected how they do things. And so we, we had an opportunity to send them to this Woodbury Forest down in Orange, Virginia. Okay. And uh, I can remember, and, and they wanted no part of that, by the way, initially, because it was all <laughs> male. It was Virginia. Nobody ever heard of it. There was no status. And, uh, and so I said, look, we, we'll do this all night. Your mother doesn't want you to go there. You don't want to go there. Your grandmother doesn't want to go there. You're going. Okay. And we, you could cry all night. We could fight all night with your mother. It's all good. I'm, that's where you're going to go, and you can determine by your by your wit and your academic and your performance where you go to college. Mm. So if you have if you have grades to go to MIT and you want to go there, fine. If you want to, but what you're not going to do is you're not going to go to a worse school than those. Right, right. I can guarantee you. <laughs> that's not happen because you're just playing. But I mean, but so they went down to Orange, Virginia, and and they got a tremendous amount out of it. Wow. And obviously, Seamus's roommate, C.J. Prosite, was recruited when he was at Woodbury, and he played football for Notre Dame, as you know. Yes, and, uh, right. And they were roommates and best of friends to this day. <sighs> so uh, so I, I think that the fact that C.J. was recruited to Notre Dame and Seamus won, you know, that added to their friendship. Sure. And Seamus, so, and I remember Seamus actually saying to me, you know, he was so determined not to go to this Woodbury Forest in the middle of nowhere, wow. Virginia. That he said, you know, Dad, I've done some analysis, and there's only one kid that ever came out of Woodbury in the last 20 years that's gone to Notre Dame. 
And it was actually John Glenn's son. And, uh, and, and I, said, I said, that's exactly right. And that's how many people I want you competing with. No one. You know, I mean, and, you know, so, you know, I, I don't want to hear about Del Barton where they send 87 guys to Notre Dame and you got to be smarter than all 86 of them, you know? Right. I mean, so, uh, but anyway, so they both, you know, they went and CJ Collard followed Seamus at Woodbury and he was, you know, he went through a little period where he was not sure about Notre Dame. I remember we were playing golf one day and he, he kind of took some shots at, you know, the weather and the girl situation, talking to the caddy. And, you know, I kind of rang him up and I said, look, pal, you know, you're not in the family yet. You're a, you're a high school kid. <laughs> crying, you know, you know, James wants to take a shot at Notre Dame. That's his prerogative. Right, He's in the right. I'm, I'm in the family. I can take you are nowhere. So you don't want to go to Notre Dame. That's fine, but you keep your mouth shut until <laughs> until you either, you know until you have firsthand experience. And it was interesting because uh, and then obviously that was not the right way to handle it. And we had several holes that was kind of quiet. <laughs> and he told me later that the caddy said, you know, uh, your dad doesn't confuse his role as a friend versus a father. Wow. He's very serious about his job as a father. You should appreciate that. Mm. Anyway, so he told me that years later. He didn't tell me that that day. <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. But, but anyway, so that, that's how it kind of evolved. And, and, and Notre Dame just wasn't the right place for Jackie, although she she loves Notre Dame. And as I said in the commencement, she wears her Notre Dame jacket all around around France. So, you know, we're, we're pretty committed to the school. Well, I want to kind of talk about, like, thinking about how, pr how proud your dad was when you graduated, can you kind of juxtapose that against kind of how your family, how you felt when your kids did? I mean, was it kind of, you know, hey, you know, I had struggles there. You know, hey, this is great. You know, it's a great place. I mean, was it the same type of feeling? I mean, what do you think kind of your dad felt versus kind of you? You know, uh, you know, Chris, it's an interesting and I bet this is true. This is sort of a dark secret for a lot of families. Oddly enough, all three graduations were tainted by, by something. So it took a lot of the joy out of it. And I'm sure we're not the only family in the world that ever that, that happened. Uh, I had really goofed off my senior year. It was touch and go whether or not I had gotten all the credits exactly right. And I remember my father just being annoyed about it because I kind of gave him the soft, like, I'm not exactly sure. He was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then unfortunately, I don't want to tell a school, but one of my college, one of my close, close friends and best friends, is, he didn't quite cross the, the bridge. So he had an empty diploma. And uh, <sighs> so, you know, I, I kind of took, some, you know, they, I remember, and then later, you know, with Seamus and just the different things that go on. He was out sure. all night and and then CJ was bickering with Seamus. So all three graduations were kind of, uh, they weren't our shining, none of our shiniest moments. Wow. But, 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 but I, I'm, I'm very proud of all my children. They're, they're all, they're all loyal and ferocious. You know, they're mm. all, they, they're willing to defend their position they're intensely loyal to their friends. They're intensely loyal to what they stand for. They're all leaders in their own way. You know, my daughter, you know, I was always very tough on the boys and she would, she would have no problem getting in my face and telling me, you know, and I was often wrong, but, uh, and now the boys, they, they came out the other side of it better, you know, but, uh, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the whole experience. The sure. whole thing. And, uh, but with graduation, oh boy, it's sort of like weddings. I think sometimes there's more tension than there needs to be. So oh, I could imagine. I could. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. where do you think they learned kind of this ferociousness? I mean, was it from you, you and your wife? I mean, was it from kind of the environment they grew up in? I mean, is this something that they were they were they kind of saw as kind of a young maybe teenage years and eventually kind of got it from you? What, what do you think? Well, I. You know, I think we've all tried to instill, you know, you got to stand for something. you got to stand for your friends. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's funny because we just saw a picture of this little boy that he grew up with. And and I, I remember there was a problem and there was a fight at school and all this other stuff. And we were in the car and the other dad was sort of lecturing the two boys about fighting and this and that. And 
you know, and, and I, you know, I, I didn't agree with them. I said, look, sometimes you got to stand there and, and take the beating, you know, and, uh, you know, Seamus, this guy said this, you know, you're going to lose the fight. Well, you know, you got to, you got to take And father was like, are you out of your mind? And I said, just, you, you worry about what you're doing. I'm going to worry about what I'm doing. Sure. All right. And, you know, I, I wasn't like, you know, you, you walk away from every fight. Sometimes you got to take the punch, you know, and, uh, and, and we, we laugh about that now, but because uh, obviously they were all expecting this, don't fight, it's wrong, you know, all this. And, and I do believe that, but in this particular case, he, he should he stand there and take take the ass whoop, you know? And yeah. uh, uh, so I, I guess a little bit of that probably, you know, I've, I've tried to do the right thing. I've tried to, you know, I've tried to give perspective. We've talked a lot about different heroes in history, whether it was, Churchill or Mandela or Lincoln or Father Hesburgh, you know, about making courageous decisions. And, and those are the things people remember, not the not, not the little moment of your, your gain or your loss at that time. You got to view things from perspective. I think probably 9-11, you know, they were very young. That was 20 years ago. Um, so Seamus is 29-ish, eight. So he was eight. CJ was five. Jackie was two. Uh, you know, so I think that they... You know, I mean, I was really working then. So that sort of five years, even when I was there, I probably was only three quarters of the way there or half of the way there. Yeah. And uh, I do miss that a lot of that. I mean, the period, you know, I, I can remember like being at the table, this and that, and then like an hour would pass and I and I physically wasn't there. I mean, I was physically there, but meant they weren't there. So yeah. but they probably, you know, they probably got some of that and that, you know, we, we tried to conduct ourselves in, in a fashion that they'd be, be, you know, that was both responsible and, and, and we'd be, you know, that's how we would judge it, how they felt, how we did. So, you know, I think everybody in life has an opportunity to demonstrate their leadership qualities. And that's what Notre Dame is all about. And it can be sacrifice. It can be quiet. It can be, it can be just a tiny example, but you know, I, I was always conscious that their eyes were on me. Now with that being said, I regret a lot. I I I I, I overreacted to situations. I, I I you know my language is not always what it should be, and and I, I wish I wish it were I wish I was different in that respect. But I'm 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 still working on it. I'm no, we better. all are. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. All right. So you're you're leaving your name. Can I? I mean, what was your first job in the financial field? I mean, is this something that you knew you wanted to do? Not really. I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I thought I would go to law school. And as I mentioned in the commencement, right. they, uh, including Notre Dame, uh, you know, they I got rejected. I applied to some very good law schools and Notre Dame was my safe school. So <laughs> Hesburgh had written, Father Hesburgh had written me a letter. In fact, I, I ran the senior bar, Chris, my last year there. And, and the reason I got, I saw an ad in the Observer and it said the highest paying job on campus. So I said, well, I got to get this job. Right? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I did get the job and it paid 125 a week, which was a lot of money <laughs> in college at those days. Anyway. Of course. And and I we had a few incidents up there and, and I had Hesburg come up and speak to the staff about integrity and this is not your money and these are your friends, but you got to charge him. I, I, I was in the, and I, and for some wow. reason he did it. He always did it. He came up and spoke. Wow. And anyway, he was great. And I remember going up to his office and he had a, his assistant had a chronic hand issue. She, okay. she, she had a problem with her hands. Okay. And I remember walking in and she, she looked up and, and, uh, and she said, hello, Jimmy. And I said, can I see him? He said, you don't have an appointment, do you, Jimmy? I said, absolutely not. He goes, just sit down for a second. And so I went in and I said, listen, Father Ted, you know, I, I need your help because, you know, I need, I want to get into law school and, and you got to, you know, you got to tell that man over there what I'm all about. You, you got to have, and then, and, and I remember like it was yesterday, Father Hesburgh said, well, well, Jimmy, law school? I said, yeah. And he said, well, you should go to, into business. You are, you are going to do really well in business. And I said, Ted, I mean, I didn't say Ted. I said, Father Ted, are you, are you for me or against me here? You know, I mean, I was right, right back at him. He said, no, I'm for you. Then, then are you going to write this? Are you going to help me or not? And he said, no, I'll do it. And he wrote a letter and the guy called me and I, you know, he wouldn't interview. So I walked him from his office down to his car <laughs> and uh, I didn't get in. 
And uh, <laughs> but I recently gave the law school a million dollars thanking me for not letting me. <laughs> That's it a was, great it, story. Was, it, was, it was better that they did. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. But, uh, but, but, you know, Hesburgh had a presence and, and he, and, uh, and he was, we were friendly. We, we talked. In fact, when, when I, when father John, uh, when, when I wanted to, I ran the campaign, the last campaign that we mm-hmm. just finished about a year ago. And, uh, I had no interest in running the campaign. And uh, but Father John, uh, Lou Nanny approached me, and then Father John, and we sat down, and he could. I, I felt a great debt to Notre Dame. I thought I could actually do it. Uh, I didn't want to do it, but I figured, you know, I kind of should do it anyway. He said, you know, Father Ted wants to talk to you about this, Jimmy. So I went up to his office, and uh, and he was blind basically then, so he was looking straight ahead. And I walked in. And I said, Father Ted, it's it's Jimmy. He said, I know who it is. You know, I know who it is. Sit down. And we actually just said, come over here. And so I come over and I stood. I didn't sit yet. And he said, look, Jimmy, you're going to do what we asked you to do. And if you do it to the best of your ability, you're going to go right to heaven. And I said, Father Ted, I would have settled for purgatory. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, right to heaven? I said, yeah, all right, I'll, I'm in. You know, you're sure about that? And, and he said, you know, anyway. But uh, that was the way he was. He was a heck of a guy. And uh and Father John, I think, has just done a spectacular job. You know, and Notre Dame just keeps getting better. I really, I really believe that. No, oh, absolutely. But, but it talks about we talk about Notre Dame getting better, and this is all facets. And, and I think it starts with the leadership, and that starts with the board, the president, and all the way down. And you have the opportunity to be a trustee. I mean, what, what has that experience been like for you? With kind of the, this literally the weight of the future of Notre Dame on your shoulders, but also kind of understanding that you know you you had a great time there, your children had a great time there. More importantly, let's hopefully provide opportunities for other great children as well. Yeah, well, I uh, obviously I was very honored when when uh, when Dick asked me to, to join the board, and uh, I was really happy about it. I had had a tough conversation with Father John prior to that about the firing of Tyrone Willingham. Uh, I was a big supporter of Tyrone Willingham, still am. We have a scholarship in his name. I didn't like the way it went down. Uh, I thought it was really, we handled it poorly. And um, uh, anyway, I, I, I really laid into him on it. You know, and this is, and, and, and later on, he, Two years later, he asked me to be on the board of trustees, which was sort of shocked me. But I felt like here's a guy that, you know, he, he did know at least, uh, you know, about what I had to say. I said to right. him, you know. Right. And so I would say my role on the board, well, I did run the campaign, which was well timed. I mean, we had this extended period of prosperity. And uh, so we were able to really take advantage of that. And people, Notre Dame people are more generous and. And so that was that all went well, and I think Jim Parsons is going to do a heck of a job. That you know, following me, he'll out do all everything I did, which is great. But uh, you know, I, I I felt so my my job there is occasionally John will call me with something. There are things that maybe I'm uniquely good at. It could be an issue. It could be a problem. But for the most part, I'm basically a cheerleader for Jack and John. You know that, that they they make really good decisions. They yep. thought about it. Uh, we've had a few little things that we, you know, that there was a little tension with, uh, but I'm really there, you know, Jay Jordan, the great Jay Jordan, who is my predecessor on the campaign, just a magnificent guy. I remember him, this guy saying he wanted X, Y, Z. And Jay said, no, look, you don't, you're not listening. Okay. You're a benefactor. You see, benefactors give, they don't get, <laughs> you know? you're, you're a benefactor. You give, you get nothing. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I thought, you know, that he's right, you know, and that's that's sort of the role that that we've taken. And and if I asked advice, at, whether it's at an executive committee meeting or Father John might just call me, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm on the other end of the phone and I'll do do what I can the best I can. And when, you know, when he called me on the commencement, I had no desire to do that. I didn't think I could do it. But, you know, John asked me and. Um, uh, he, he talked me into doing it, but he was the only one that was confident about it. I can tell you, I, I promise you, Jack Brennan was. 
<laughs> and I know I wasn't confident about it. And if you really ask all my roommates, they weren't too confident. <laughs> well, well, folks. I would say Lou Nanny and Father John were the only two people. And and uh, and Ann, Ann Firth. I think Ann Firth was confident. You know, but those were the only people in the entire area that thought this could go okay. And I was um, absolutely relieved <laughs> that it went the way it did. I can promise you that. Folks, this is, I mean, you were talking about a really an amazing story, but more importantly, kind of what um, Jim was talking about is, like I said, I didn't have a chance to see it in person. Um, I saw it on a YouTube video and I didn't check this morning, but I know that last time I checked, there were about 37,000 views. So obviously, um, Ann, Lou and Father John knew it, and along with 37,000 other people did, myself included. And I think what was really kind of uh, a unique kind of uh, spin on why you were there, we're, ta we're talking about facing adversity. And when you look at kind of what these students really kind of had to kind of go through as far as not being um, – there for a period of time in school, virtual learning. I mean, it was very chaotic. And who else to have someone who kind of really had a chance to kind of overcome some really hard faced adversity in what your experience was, Jimmy, but more important was able to tie it back to kind of the lessons you learned at, at Notre Dame. I mean, and I think that's what, what, what I got out of it. And what I'm talking about is, I mean, you were able to literally put the, your firm back together after the horrific event of 9-11. Of, of, of and um, there's a video I'd like to show. We're back at 8 o'clock on this Tuesday morning. It's the 11th day of September 2001. You're looking at the people gathered outside our studio here. It was a beautiful day, but it was a, a cold a frost delay, I guess. And so we got out a little later, and I had played the first four holes that go pretty good. I think I was one under after four, and a man in a tie, USGA guy, came out and said, you have to go call your office. He said a plane hit the World Trade Center. Of the 171 Sandler O'Neill employees, 83 were in the South Tower. Only 17 made it out. The firm for all of us became a kind of a weapon. Well, our strategy is going to be, what would Osama bin Laden not want us to do? I said, we're just going to do the absolute opposite. If your husband was just killed, what goes through your mind? The first thing that goes through your mind is your kids. The second thing is, how do I pay for it? So I said, okay, and I just tried to imagine. I said, all right, the first thing they can worry about is cash flow. So bang, we're going to pay them, obviously, through the end of the year, and we'll pay them bonuses that were greater than what they ever received. That's the short-term cash flow. Second thing they're going to worry about is benefits. So with the help of our CFO, I figured out how long that we could really stand to do it, and then I doubled it because I just did. <laughs> and then was the education. And we started a foundation. And that was going to pay for all the education for their kids. It matters a lot to me. Because it's, the, it's their dads. It's their people and who... And they're not there to fight for them. Right. And you are. Well, you got that right. Yeah. It was sad. It's still sad. We don't run from it. It's, it's part of who we are. We're proud of what we were before. We're proud of what we did. And we think they'd be proud of us, too. It was interesting. Uh, we were hosting the Walker Cup. Uh, which is a great amateur tournament down at, at uh, Seminole. And I was uh, going to give the opening remarks to the, the beginning of the week. And I was just about to go up to give my little speech. And no matter what, when you give a talk, you got a little, uh, you got some, you know, your blood's flowing a little bit and you got a lot of people there and you want to get, represent your, in this case, Seminole Golf Club the best I could. And I saw John Jenkins come up on my phone and I was like, ooh, you know, that's not, you know, that he wouldn't call me like at 7.30 at night, you know. And, <laughs> and so I, I picked it up. I said, John, Jimmy, everything okay? He said, well, Jimmy, we have a problem and a solution. And so I said, well, great, John, then you don't need me. 
he said, <laughs> he, and he said, no, 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 I do need you. You're the solution. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, we, we're going to need a speaker uh, for the commencement. And uh, I said, oh, no, no, Aunt John, I'll, I'll get you some. I'll get Condi Rice or I'll get uh, Cardinal Dolan. I, I'll get a good, I'll get <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, this is not 30 guys in a bar. Me talk, I can talk to 30 guys in a bar. I'm not oh talking gosh. to, you know, all the academics and, and all the parents. I'm not, that's, I'm not your guy. They said, you know, he's basically said, you're the perfect guy for the reason you just gave. And he said, look, we've been through a lot, but, you know, I also want to give kids the perspective that, you know, other people, there, there are things that are going to be harder. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, let, let me talk to you about it in the morning. And uh, I, I said, well, I will, but I want to thank you for something. And he said, well, what's that? I said, I'm no, I'm no longer nervous about giving this speech. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a lot now you got my mind racing. So thanks for that, you know. Mm. Anyway, so we talked the next day. I tried a little bit to kind of talk him out of it. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'll make a deal with you that, you know, the way you are, once you ask me to do this and I say yes, if somebody comes back and says they can do it, you're going to tell them no, and I don't want that. you got to give me your word that if, <laughs> if, it's written, if somebody comes back and says they sure. can do it, you, you flush me down the toilet and use him. And he said, well, I can't do that. They said, well, that's the deal. I'm not going to do it otherwise. And so anyway, we, we kind of agreed to that, and then he uh, he rushed up the announcement a little earlier than he could. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but when we were walking out there, it was Jack Brennan, myself, and Father John, and I was, I was hyped. I was nervous. And mm. uh, I said, boy, I tell you one thing. You know, you guys got to understand something. If I flop out here in the next couple hours, you guys are going to look as bad as I am because no one's going to think I could have done it. But you two are going to look like idiots for having me do this. Oh, my you know? God. And John just looked around and said, I, I've never been, you know, he was like, I've never been more confident. I've never been more relaxed in my life. Wow. And he really, he sort of exuded that. And uh, and it was it was, it was was cool. And and then uh, uh, when I went up there, I had a great trustee, Ted McCourtney, he had reminded me about this story I told one time and I hadn't planned to do it. And I just sort of hit me on the head and I told a story about, you know, Kevin Williams, who you've talked about. And, uh, and it seemed, that seemed to go well. It took, it took about nine minutes though, uh, which I didn't realize it was that long of a story. But it, it, so that was, I was up there a little longer than I should have been, but, but that went well. And then I gave the speech and, and I've just been really happy with the response that people have gotten. And it's been, mm. been, been wonderful. And my, my kids were there, my college roommates were there uh it was it was a very you know tim near a friend of mine who encouraged me to do it went to cornell uh he said this will be something you'll remember forever and uh and he, you know so he and, and david novak and ed hurley they were all about you know doing it i said yeah you guys are all about me doing it because you're not going to be there when i fall on my face <laughs> but uh anyway I'm, I'm i was incredibly honored to do it and uh you know i got in friday and i went up there and you know, the stage it was a good stage and the mic was very good. And I got a lot of confidence in that the mic was good. And it just, it sort of went and, uh, you know, it's history. I've, I've watched it one, I watched it that night. Okay. I haven't watched it again, so I'm, I'm sure I'll find some fault with it. But uh, I did the best I could. No, it, it was a, a phenomenal message because, I mean, it was from the heart. But I think more importantly, the students there, the parents there, really got a sense of kind of not only who you are, but what Notre Dame means to you and what Notre Dame could mean to the thousands of kids that were, that were in the audience, okay? Because the story you talked about literally could have been anybody's story in, 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 the, in, in the stadium. And the leadership qualities, your experiences, who you are, they all experienced that being there for four years. And yeah. I think that's what was so unique was that you talked about an experience where you were able to provide this great, great leadership, but you also tied it into that leadership, those qualities, the love of humanity, the, 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 the love of not only your, your friends, your family, your, your fellow employees, but human beings. And it, you learn that at Notre Dame. Well, you know, one thing I will say, and my my nephew uh, 
James Wright had sent me a text before I, that the night before, and somehow he had calculated since I graduated, which would have been seventy-eight. So what? Let's say six thousand times forty, whatever that is, one hundred and twenty. Whatever those that he said, you know, there's been, and I don't even know if he's right, but he said you'll be the second Notre Dame alumni to address the the um, the. And I know Alan Page did it, so there's one for okay, sure, right? Uh, and there had to be somebody else, but so I, I, but but the point, his point was, you know, it's 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 pretty unusual to have a Notre Dame guy giving it, which, sure. which don't, and I and I got to thinking later that, well, that that's sort of silly, you know. I mean, you know, we, you know, because in a way, I could share, my, you know, years ago, but a perspective, and then a perspective as a parent, a perspective Absolutely. as a trustee. So I, my my attitude day one is I was I was going to talk to these students and to their families. And I was going to talk unabashedly about my love for Notre Dame mm. and what it had taught me and my and how I benefited from it and things that happened in my life that I, you know, I said, you know, you, you never outgrow the grotto, right. which is something, Chris, I'm, you know, I'm, whether you're religious or not or wh whatever Absolutely. you are, you, you tend to, you know, if you're there, you tend to go by the grotto and just think about your mother. Or th I don't know if you do or you don't, but I would bet you do. And, uh, and we all do. And so, I just kind of put these things together with with you know my experience and then and then a little bit about what this day was about and the fact that we had lost guys in 9/11 and and they they were graduating too and we you know just it was coincidental but we had the karate family who I you know Kevin worked and I talked about Kevin in the speech and so they were all there and I had I had, had a drink with them the day before so it all kind of melded together and uh and I was just, you know, very proud to be amongst them, very optimistic about what they've done. Mm -hmm. And also the thing that really gets lost a little bit is Notre Dame took a stand on this early. I mean, basically COVID-19 was a political weapon. It was used as either a weapon or a bomb, depending sure. on your perspective. Sure. Very few people treated it as a serious disease that we've got to worry about and be as safe as we can, but life has to go on. Notre Dame took that position. It didn't take a political stance on this. It said, what is it? Where are we at risk? What can we do about it? Can we do this? Because there's a risk but not going to school. And 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 Father John in his article in the I thought was excellent in the in the journal, the Times, wherever it was. Mm -hmm. And basically he had the guts to stand up and say, no, we're gonna we're gonna do this and we're gonna try and we think we can do it safely, and we're gonna spend thirty million dollars to make sure we're doing that. And who knows? And, you know, I, I remember one executive committee meeting, I asked how many people have had COVID that have gone overnight to the hospital, stayed overnight. And they said, well, two. One was a teacher who got it from their, not from Notre Dame, and one was a large football player, and they kept them overnight for observation. Mm -hmm. So, but we, but Father John, the administration, and maybe a little begrudging, but the faculty eventually uh, you know, got behind this and, and presented this opportunity to our students, which was infinitely better than most every other school in the country. Mm. And, uh, and, and you know, we couldn't crow about that. But, you know, these kids had a lot to appreciate. Now, sure, we didn't, you know, they took down the, the hoops of the basketball and, <laughs> you know, we got a daily updates. But, you know, I was trying to make a parallel that right. people can have it worse than this. And, uh, and most did. But, and I think Notre Dame students were very responsive to that and their families were very, I think they were appreciative to say nothing about saving the college football season, which I think we did also because, of, you know, we, we have the idea of a student athlete and, you know, if we weren't going to be students, we weren't going to just play sports. And so um, I was really proud of Father John, really proud of Jack Brennan, really proud of the whole class and proud of what Notre Dame did. And I think most people are. And I think there's, you know, there's part of our country that is starting to recognize you know, there's something to be said for these values well, and the consistency it, of those values. You know, and it means a lot to me because currently um, we have a daughter at St. Mary's. Good. And it was kind of listening to you, kind of thinking about my experiences there, really kind of put me in a perspective of, you know, now I'm not just this guy who comes back on football weekends now, right? Yeah. Now I'm the guy who has to walk up three flights of stairs because the – the elevator broke in her dorm, but that's a right. whole different story. Um, <laughs> but it's the idea that it's now more of a family for me. Definitely. And kind of watching our daughter go through 
what all the students had had to go through with the pods and the outside learning and all. So it, it was it was really refreshing to see that they that Notre Dame tried everything to get the kids in class in person versus we have friends whose kids are at other schools and they literally did remote learning all year round. You know, it's Belichick and I'm no huge Belichick fan, but, but uh -huh. I mean, Bel Belichick is a good coach. And he said something one day, he said, look, you know, I'm going to make mistakes and we're going to do things wrong, but we're not going to play scared. And there it's very hard to do anything if you're playing scared. It's really hard and, and it's, it's not worth it. And, uh, you know, John is not perfect. He's pretty darn close, but he's not perfect. Okay. But he doesn't play scared. Mm -hmm. you know, he's got guts and backbone and so does Jack Brennan. And so does, you know, so, so does, uh, Jay Flaherty and so does Chris Reyes. And, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, so does Jay Jordan. And so, we we have a lot of people like that that are we, 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 we're gonna you, know, you got to take some risk occasionally you've got to you've got to be able to stand for something and I think that that I think the the you know he, we treated the pandemic as what it was it right. was we had to understand it we had to understand limitations understand the vulnerability work tirelessly have all, you know get at times where things didn't look so good but but they did it and they provided a, a world class opportunity you know for these students where a lot of other schools just you know gave it you know they're still floundering around mm -hmm. you know whether or not they're going to go back to school or not mm -hmm. so I, I i was immensely proud of what john did and i thought what jack brennan did at the commencement was recognizing it i thought was really worthwhile and what i wanted to do is just you know obviously i you know it's, it's really hard to get a notre dame degree it's really hard to get into notre dame and it's a sacrifice and you got to work harder and 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 so it was great, but I also thought we should really appreciate the families that went to so much trouble to get them there, the the, the whole faculty that worked hard to keep them there, Absolutely. the administration that supported it under fire. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, every day we wake up and the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune is just dying to say something yeah. bad about Notre Dame. Right. I mean, that's all <laughs> what it is, you know. And, you know, and it's our job to make that difficult for them. And uh, we're, we're still not playing scared. And so uh, I'm not one of these guys that looks back and say, God, it was great then. Now, believe me, I think 1978, 77, 78, 76 <laughs> was a pretty, pretty wonderful time to be at Notre Dame. Right. I mean, I think we won a national championship. I think we went to the Final Four. I think we won another fencing championship. We were growing academically really, really well. It was a wonderful period of time. I, I you know, it was Camelot, if you wanted. But, uh, but it's, I don't walk around now and say, geez, you know, this isn't like it when I was there. Yeah, no right. alumni hall is still there, but you know there are some great dorms up on the upper on the north quad now. I even live up in the north quad now, where I wouldn't have thought that was possible. <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I just I'm enormously proud of really what everyone else has done, and I and I'm just very glad that we could share this with our family. David Novak, when CJ was a little quimmering on a Notre Dame thing. And, and he had some good reasons to do that because uh -huh. he wanted, in a way he wanted to go through, I think a little bit about what my mother told me to go through when okay. she was dying. And that maybe Vanderbilt or a school like that or Michigan. I remember he talked about going to Michigan and we were playing golf with the aforementioned Tom Brady. And uh, he was in the other room and he said, look, he really thought he was going to go to want to go to Michigan. I said, well, let me tell you something. That's, I'm not even going to pay for that. You know, <laughs> And, and 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 Brady yelled from the other room, "I got you covered, CJ." I <laughs> so I said, "Well, that's fine, but I, I'm not paying. For it. Uh, there's no way I'm going to do that." You know. And, uh, but 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 the point was, David Novak, you know, talked to, to CJ and said, "How, you know, look, don't don't be foolish here. Now, this is something that you can share forever." I, I come over on Labor Day. We play in a golf tournament, and then we invariably we have our first game. We play Texas on the road that weekend this year we have florida state we had louisville i guess two years ago and so we'll play in the tournament and then come back and watch the game and he said you know i just i just love it i the my roommates there cj's there seamus is there the mm. other kids are there you know i feel like i'm part of it i kind of wish i had gone to notre dame wow. don't you know if, if you really decide that you have to have a unique reason why you've got to go to vanderbilt or got to go somewhere else Let's think about it carefully. And then that, I think, turned the tide and that he, 
he, he, I don't think he, he they, you know, he went early decision Notre Dame and went. So, uh, but it's, 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 it's been a great tradition for our family and, 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 and we love it and, and very, and, and appreciate everything she's done for us. That's, that's absolutely fabulous. Uh, Jim, we're, we're going to kind of wind down a little bit, but I wanted to get a kind of your take and talk a little bit about kind of the lessons you've learned kind of over your lifetime, basically about leadership and culture, because culture is huge for me. But we talked a little bit before about uh, a little bit about parents in leadership. But I was wondering if you can share maybe a couple of lessons for us. Well, again, and this kind of goes back to things that my father talked to me about. But you know, I've always been a great believer, in, and it, it isn't always easy. But whatever you're doing, they're going to talk about it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. So you better decide. What role do you want to play in this thing? And the other, so that's the first thing. I mean, you, you don't get away with anything, all right? Eventually, it'll all come out. And just accept that you, 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 you can decide what role you're going to play in this. And the other thing is, and I can remember my father, you know, he, Billy Graham gave a talk, and I, you know, I don't, you know, he, we, we watched it one night, and Billy Graham was talking about the power of the word no, that sure. you've got to at times in your life. And he talked about a mob boss and this and that and how the guy, you know, he told him no. And uh, he thought that was going to be it for him. And fortunately, it wasn't. But, you know, they're going to be that moment, you know, in a much less eloquent and glamorous sure. way. That was a little bit of what I was trying to tell Seamus, you know, 20 years ago in that or 24 years ago in that car. But look, sometimes you you know, and the, even though the odds are against you, you got to take right. a beating. Sometimes you right. got to just stand there and get hit. I always would tell him, like, find the toughest guy, hit him first. You know, probably, <laughs> probably that you're gonna get you're gonna get some of the whiz beat out of you. But sometimes you surprise them. Sometimes you know, they're like stone, but you punch them, and you know, they, and then by the way, you never have to fight again. Right, you know, right, exactly. Once you, you take on the toughest guy, so, uh, you know, I, I I was not afraid of of losing. I think that's, and I also don't mind playing from behind, even in golf. I, I, I just like, I, I kind of feel as if everything has worked out better than it should have for me. And as a result, I'm not overly interested in just protecting, you know, if they take it, they take it, you know? Sure. And, uh, and I think I got a lot of that from Herman Sandler. Actually, my boss, you know, who was my partner at Sandler O'Neill, he had a very, he was willing to roll it and uh, and accept that this is this is what we are, this is what we're going to do. And there's, you know, I've also there's sort of no limitation how far you can push something if you're right. And you got to be, you know, you got to stand there and do that. And now, with that being said, I made some idiotically stupid mistakes, uh, you know, when I was younger. I, I made bad decisions, which. Sure. Uh, I, I have regretted. I, you know, I didn't stop drinking till I was 27. That was 10 years too long. I wish I had stopped when I was 17. But mm. uh, and so you make a lot of mistakes when you had you compound that stuff into it. But on balance, I've always kind of had the view that you know this is temporary, and at some point in time, we're going to have to go up and explain to somebody just what we did. And at that time, whether or not you have another car or another house or any of that, it's not going to mean too much. It's going to it's going to be, you know, what kind of father were you? What kind of husband were you? What kind of friend were you? These are the things that are going to be important. I, I always say on, you know, at work, you know, we get into these issues. I said, look, there's a right and there's a wrong, you know. Sure. And, if, you know, if you're out here to defend a mistake, I'm going to carve you into a, a million different pieces. And, and by the way, you know, when this is all said and done, if we end up going to the place and they're talking about what we're talking about, right. he'll be working for me because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that this is this is a finite issue. This is, right. you know, this is about money. This is about doing the right thing. We do it and we move on and we accept whatever the consequences are. So, but I think that goes that that goes a lot to to my parents, to our family, to my education, and certainly to Notre Dame. There was always, you know, we always knew about Hesper going to Chicago when it was very unpopular to march with Martin Luther King, mm. and that was not well received. But, you know, I knew early on that that was the right thing to do. And I've kind of tried to 
emulate some of those things in my own life. Mm. Fabulous. All right. Last question. The best advice you got from a mentor of yours? Well, that would be my father. And, okay. uh, and maybe he knew I wasn't the brightest kid on the block or, <laughs> but, but he, he always taught me to anticipate, you know, and, and, and also to really listen carefully. And so, as I said, I think I might've said in the commencement or not, I, I, I got to watch it again, but you know, there are, there are three kinds of listening. There's, you know, people that don't listen at all. Now okay. they can still be successful. There are cases, usually they're in politics. Okay. But, I mean, <laughs> but, but, uh, but you know, there is some cases of that. I, I, I would not be eligible for that. <laughs> and then there are people that listen just enough to get a response and you're really not listening. Okay. And then, and then there are people that listen like every, like every word your life depends on. And that doesn't mean that every imbecile deserves an audience. You know, that just means that, you know, you, you better. And so he was, he was very big about hearing it, hearing it carefully and then deciding and also anticipate where things are going. You know, don't be, he said that he, so many smart guys that he's around and they talk about what has happened or, you know, what is happening. You got to think about what, where it's going. What's sure. the next thing? Sure. What, what is important? Uh, I can remember talking to John Weinberg at Goldman Sachs and I was all about municipal bonds. And he said, you know, geez, he said, what happens if they change the tax law? And I said, well, if they change the tax law, that'd be very bad for municipal bonds. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, think about that when you're on the beach or on the golf course, you know? And, <laughs> right. you know, and so I think just the notion about being present, being really present, but at the same time, anticipating what's next, what's coming. Mm. How, how, what is the reaction going to be when I say this? Those kinds of things have been very, were, were, you know, and that, that helped me kind of make up the ground that maybe where I wasn't as strong in other areas. I, okay. I was thinking ahead. I was thinking about what this person is going to say when he says that. You know, those kinds of things have been very helpful. To me. Jim, this has been great. Uh, I wish we had another hour of talk. This, this has been absolutely what You've been very gracious with your time. I'm excited. Hopefully we'll have a chance to see each other at a game uh, sometime th this year. Um, we'd like to thank everyone listening and watching to this episode of the Zorch Podcast, Conversations with Leaders and Legends. i also like to thank my wife, who is my wife, Candy, who's my producer and director, because without her, I'm kind of shaking this stuff. Uh, this podcast, along with our other podcasts, uh, you can check out at my YouTube page at youtube.com slash chriszorch50 as well as on Apple, Spotify, and Google uh, Podcasts as well. Sorry. Um, also, check out the description below. We have books by several folks who have been on the podcast, Joe Montana, Jerome Bettis, and Lou Holtz. And also want to give one last plug to checking out myself and Marcus Freeman at the Notre Dame of the Chicago. It, 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 well, first of all, it's a great interview. Great interview. He, Marcus, is just – I, there were several times, Jimmy. I swear, man, I wanted to like literally suit up and play. I mean, this guy. I, I, love, I, I you know, I, I, Coach Kelly has done a great job. He kind of looked at where the world was three or four years ago, decided he was going to make some changes. He deserves the credit, and and Jack Schwarbrook to getting getting this coach. This guy is going to make a difference for us. He's gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna. Like he says, we talk about winning with thirty three and three, but I mean, but but we we got to win that last game. Absolutely. And, and is, so we're actually going to cover things like that as well um, at, at the Chicago, Northern Club of Chicago's Rocky Gala that's on July 22nd. And I'll be hosting kind of a, a Q&A with Marcus. Uh, the game will be held at Morgan uh, MFG 401 North Morgan in Chicago. Um, for more details, please go to ndchicago.org. Jimmy, this has been great, man. I, I look forward to another conversation. This has been beautiful. You inspired me. Had a chance to, to, to watch the YouTube video. I want to encourage everyone. I'll also put a link to the YouTube video for them to, to, to check it out because as a 50-year-old, as a 52-year-old guy, I was inspired. So you, you really got me fired up, which is the reason why I contacted you because I was like, this is great. I want other people to see it. I appreciate it, Chris. It's been a great you're a great Notre Dame man, and I uh, love your enthusiasm. And anything I can do to help you, you let me know.
Sounds wonderful. Jimmy, thank you very much. Go Irish. Go Irish.